Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered, to, Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. There's no doubt that we live in a world that is rapidly changing. Many of these changes and transformations are exciting. People will get in line for the new iPhone or the new whatever the case may be. Some of these transformations are really exciting. And yet at the same time, some of these changes are downright discouraging. In all of these fluctuations, there seems to be a kind of allergy to things that don't change. Have you noticed that? So much is changing around us that we sort of get bored when things don't change. It's been the same thing for more than a year. It's been the same thing. This allergy to things that don't change is often, to ref is often referred to as boredom. And boredom is not just something that our children deal with. Boredom is not just something for teenagers. Boredom is for all of us. But those of us who are adults and have children who know better than to tell anybody we're bored, because that's when you get given a dish towel, right? You get given tasks when you say, I'm bored, right, kids? Uh, but boredom seems to plague all of us. All the products on all the shelves and all the, star all the stores are labeled with new, improved, redesigned. Why? Because nothing in this world could be worse than the same old shampoo or the same old recipe. Everything has to be new, everything has to be fresh, everything has to be redesigned. I'm sure that there are many unwanted consequences due to this constant pursuit of change, but the one that's weighing on my mind today is our aversion to perseverance. We live in a world that's constantly changing, and in many ways this is good, but in many ways I think it makes it harder for us to persevere. When it seems like everything is new and improved, it can be extra difficult to stick it out in the same old job. When everything seems like it's streamlined and faster, it's harder to wait. When it seems like everything is repackaged and reformulated, it can seem incredibly difficult to stay in the same old marriage, going to the same old church, praying to the same old God, it can be tougher than we dare admit simply because we're bored. Galatians 6 calls us to perseverance, and we read these words there in Galatians 6. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
And Jesus tells us plainly in Matthew 24, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Boredom, or whatever we may call it, that destroys perseverance has incredible consequences. The Bible speaks plainly to our struggles with boredom and the challenge of trusting God when situations don't change and not only don't improve, they get worse. So as we get into Job chapter 2 this morning, we'll clearly see the wisdom of perseverance and the nature of faith to persist when things don't get better. The big idea I hope to draw out of these first 10 verses of Job chapter 2 are this. When pain increases, wise faith persists. When pain increases, wise faith persists. I hope to cause this big idea to stick in your mind and to stick with you and to be a guide for you. And so as we walk through this text... We'll take three particular steps, three points this morning. First, we'll look at verses 1 through 6, and we'll take note of how rebellion continues, particularly looking at how Satan is still raging against the Lord. In verses 7 and 8, we'll notice how pain increases, and here we will see and look closely at the pain that is inflicted upon the already grieving Job. And then in verses 9 and 10, We'll highlight and look more carefully at how wise faith persists. A little review before we get to point number one. The book of Job began by telling us that Job was a blameless and upright man who feared God and turned away from evil. Job was remarkably godly. Job wasn't only remarkably godly, Job was also incredibly blessed. He was a man who had been given ten children. His home was well run, and his earthly riches were beyond everyone in that country. Job was a man known for his godliness and a man known for his wealth. Job's faith was also known by God, and in chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, we learn about a contest that breaks out in heaven. God is delighting in Job's continual and unceasing worship, and Satan accuses God of manufacturing this worship by blessing Job so richly. God is delighting in Job's worship, and, and Satan comes along and says, Job isn't really worshiping you. He's just enjoying all of the gifts that you've given him. That's not actual worship. Satan is mocking the Lord, and he's saying, You've, you've done this in Job. This isn't Job, Job's faith. This isn't Job actually responding to your goodness, God. This is just Job enjoying stuff. Satan mocks God's pleasure in Job, and Satan sins against God by claiming that God is unworthy of the worship that Job is giving him. Satan challenges his maker in verse 11 of chapter 1, and there we read, Stretch out your hand and touch all that Job has, and he will curse you to your face. Satan is challenging God, and he says, all you've got to do is you've got to strike Job's possessions, and he's going to curse you to your face. He doesn't really love you. He only loves your blessings. God permits this request of Satan, and so this enemy of God's glory set out to defame God's glory by stealing and destroying all of Job's possession and killing each of his ten children. I think it's good to just pause and take a breath from time to time to think that actually happened. This is really what has gone on. Incredible suffering has overtaken Job. And in the wake of this tsunami of devastation that has landed on Job to destroy his worship, Job says, gloriously, wisely, with all the help of the Lord, in chapter 1, verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's important that we understand that these words were most likely spoken from a man deeply grieving, a man deeply stunned, deeply broken, and a face full of tears. 
He's lost much, and yet he says, the Lord has given, the Lord's taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. The beauty and worthiness of God are seen more clearly as Job clings to God's goodness by faith. As Job continues to worship God, even when his, his stuff, his blessings are taken away, we see that God is worthy of such worship. Job's persisting faith made evident that God is more precious than family and riches. And that might be a question that all of us need to ask to think, is God more precious than family? Is God more precious than blessings? And Job's response to all of his loss screams in our faces, absolutely. God is more precious than all of the blessings in the world. Job's persisting faith makes it evident that God is more precious. And as Satan's goals of disrupting Job's worship fail, we see that great liar for who he is. Let's look now at verses 1 through 6 and notice how this rebellion continues. So now as we come to chapter 2, we see that the rage of the Satan or the adversary is continuing. Satan hasn't laid down his arms. He hasn't given up. He says, well, that didn't work. I guess you really are worthy of worship, Yahweh. Uh, I will stop being the adversary. No, as chapter 2 begins, the evil one is still at it. This chapter begins with the word again. And verses 1 through 6 are nearly a word-for-word repetition of chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. This second scene in heaven, the second interaction between God and Satan, is almost identical, the one in chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's right, some of you have had some teacher training and you know that it's a pedagogical device uh, to drive truth deeper into a person's mind by repeating yourself. All of you parents know repetition is part of educating other people, right? But more is being accomplished here than mere reiteration. More is being accomplished by this repetition than simply making it more, making us more aware of what's going on. God is doing something here by giving us two almost identical instances of this continuing rebellion. So as we see in, in verse 1... That as these sons of God, or as we said when we dealt with chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, this heavenly host of angels, as they present themselves before God again, we learn that this wasn't an odd occurrence the first time. This is the normal pattern of an angel's existence. The repetition is not simply saying, uh, let me tell that to you again so you don't forget. This repetition is helping us see a pattern, a cycle. The same things are happening in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we see that this is a normal pattern. As God has ordained for the sun to predictably rise and set, so too all of the angelic beings regularly report to the God who rules over them. This is not just repetition for repetition's sake. This is helping us see a pattern. And as we see the Satan presenting himself again, we learn that this isn't some strange or irregular event. As the ocean's tide goes in and out, and we can look on the website or the newspaper to find when these things will happen, they go according to plan. And so, too, God's rule over demonic enemies is regular. It's patterned. It's a repeating reality. It's not a once in a while thing. It's not an irregular or odd occurrence. All of God's creatures stand before him and angelic and demonic beings regularly report to them so that God rules over them and they are held to account by him. Satan's violent roaming the earth is continual. We saw that in chapter 1, and here we are seeing it again, that he's roaming about the earth, and he's going about like a lion seeking who he can devour. His opposition of the glory of God displayed in all creation is unceasing. So it might seem that, why, didn't we read this already in chapter 1 and chapter 2? The repetition is really important so that you see there's a pattern. There's a pattern. The angels come before the Lord, Satan comes before the Lord, and the Lord exerts his authority and his leadership over them. 
Satan's violent roaming continues, and so does his lack of authority to work apart from God's sovereign permission. These things are unchanging. Satan is still on a leash. Satan is still roaming about the earth, and God is ruling over him. We are not only hearing repetition, but we are learning that these unseen realities, these things we wouldn't even know about apart from the scriptures, these things are no mere anomalies, but they are unbroken rules of God's rule over the invisible servants that he has made. Many people will like to talk about demons. Many people like to talk about angels, but understand these created beings are clearly and firmly under the authority, the leadership, and the kingly rule of God. Understand that these things are regular and patterned realities. Not only does God's sovereign rule over angels and demons continue, but in verse 3 we learn that Job's worship persists. God's pleasure in his worship continues as well. Read with me in verse 3, where it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? This is the same exact description that God gives of Job in chapter 1, word for word. And then it goes on to say, understand, God is speaking these words to the evil one. And of Job, he says, Job still holds fast his integrity although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. There's a pleasure in God, in the worship of Job, and there's a pleasure in God to speak to the evil one to say, listen, you tried to destroy him. And he's still holding fast. His worship isn't broken. You haven't broken this man like you claimed you would. And God's rule over the evil one and his joy in Job continues. Job's faith didn't crumble under the weight of his incredible losses. And his worship of God continued even in his crushing grief. As Job clung to God's gracious giving and his fair taking, he pleased his maker. And God used Job's perseverance to show his own glory to the adversary. As Satan set out to defame the Lord and to smear his reputation, Job's perseverance reflected God's worthiness. And God is pleased to make sure that Satan doesn't miss it. I hope you see the Heavenly Father standing in joy to see his, his son, to see Job persisting in faith. And I hope you see God's triumph over the evil one, over the enemy, when he says, look, you tried, but you failed. You came in here boasting a good game, Satan, but look, my worship continues. This was not such an easy task as you thought. Don't let verse 3 trip you up. We read, he still holds fast his integrity, and then that verse ends, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. When God says these words to Satan, don't get tripped up by them. God isn't admitting that Satan tricked him. He isn't saying, you incited me, or you deceived me, or you somehow got me to do something bad. No, this narrative has been clearly showing time and time again that God is fully aware of everything that's going on and that God is fully in charge of everything that is happening. God is aware of what's going on and God has permitted Satan to be the hand that has attacked Job. And here in verse 3, God is owning the fact that he sits in authority over Satan as Job's attacker. There have been many attempts to try to understand God's role in suffering to somehow put God and Satan as co-equals and they make their decisions and sometimes God wins and sometimes God loses. Sometimes God has to uh, be involved and sometimes Satan gets to do what he wants to do. That's not what's, what's being understood here. God is, is clearly saying, Job, you are the one who's attacked 
sorry, Satan, you are the one who's attacked Job, but I am in authority over you and I bear a responsibility here. God isn't excusing himself, but many in the world have made attempts to somehow excuse God, to say God isn't at all involved in the pain and the catastrophes in the world. Some people have imagined that there's some sort of sovereign free will in the beings that God has made and God has to somehow bow to the sovereign will of his creatures. Others have have tried to come up with a scheme that says creation is fallen and this fallen creation acts independently of God's rule. God created it and he just sort of has to watch it do things that he doesn't want it to do. But the book of Job shows that these attempts to somehow show that God isn't involved or God isn't responsible or isn't ruling over this situation causes these ideas to be pretty clearly out of sync with what the scriptures are teaching. God isn't washing his hands and saying, you know what, free will. Right? He's not saying, man, I really wish things could go differently, but you know what, fallen creation has to make its own decisions. God is ruling, God is here, God is close. Whether things go in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord or not, in its initial experience, God is clearly ruling over all that goes on, and he is clearly aware that he has a responsibility in what Satan has done. Scripture doesn't give us a picture of a God who is negligent. And I'm afraid many of these ideas would paint a picture that God is negligent or uncaring. God's unaware. God's hands are tied in some way. Scripture doesn't allow us to think these things of our God, our maker. Instead, as we see here, Scripture tells us of a God who is sovereignly ruling over good and evil angels and demons, and that he makes them all serve his gracious purposes. God clearly gives Satan permission to torment Job. He's not denying that. Yet it is clear, it's incredibly clear, that Satan's purposes are not God's purposes. So hear me, God is involved in the suffering in the world, but God's purposes and Satan's purposes for the particular trials, the particular sorrows, couldn't be more different. Our confession of faith puts it this way. God from eternity decrees or permits all things that come to pass and perpetually upholds, directs, and governs all creatures and all events, yet so as not in any wise to be the author or approver of sin, nor to destroy the free will and responsibility of intelligent creatures. God is fully in charge And though we often can't see and we often don't understand, he is bringing all of his gracious purposes to pass, come what may. In verse 4, Satan responds to the Lord's pleasure and Job's faithfulness. And Satan's response is not gracious defeat. He doesn't shake God's hand and say, well, maybe next time. No, Satan's rage increases. He will not bow to God's glory. He will not repent of his rebellion. Satan answers the Lord, skin for skin. All that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and Job will curse you to your face. This spitting and sputtering rage receives both sovereign permission and a yank on his leash. We spoke about those things quite a bit last time when we dealt with it in chapter 1. But understand, God does give permission, and yet there's a very clear pulling back on Satan's leash. God permits Satan to attack Job's body. But he clearly shows who is the boss by refusing refusing to allow Satan to kill Job. Satan's hatred for God and those who worship the Lord doesn't stop. Do you see this repetition? Satan doesn't hit, hit a problem and give up. He doesn't get bored and move on. He, he ups the ante. He doubles down to go after the Lord's glory 
and the Lord's people. The devil doesn't get tired and give up easily. The enemy of our souls isn't polite. Satan doesn't play fair. You and I may know well that, that uh, it's not right to kick a man when he's down. But grieving, weeping, broken Job is still the target of Satan. The devil doesn't play by any fair fight rules. He isn't impressed by Job's faith. If anything, it seems he's only angered by it as he continues to strive against God. The adversary insults God and has no qualms with attacking a man who is already grieving deeply. It's one thing to observe these things and to interact with them from a distance, but it's another thing to apply them to our lives. Saints, while I'm sure I've stirred up more questions than I've answered, I hope two things are abundantly clear from you, for you from these first six verses. First, as this con- contest between Satan and the Lord continues, Satan's rage does not lie down quietly. The enemy of our souls doesn't have a glass jaw, and he isn't encumbered with ideas of fairness. If you are in Christ, you are engaged in a lifelong battle with him. And it's good and right that our daily prayers include the request to be delivered from the evil one. There's a reason we're told about Satan going after Job twice in almost identical instances. It's because Job stands as a picture of the saint who is constantly being attacked by the evil one. Brothers and sisters, this is true of us as well. It's good and right that we wake up each and every day, not fearing the evil one, but praying to God for deliverance from him. Our resisting of the devil falls short of what is righteous often, but for us and for our salvation, Jesus perfectly resisted the devil every time that he was tempted in the wilderness and opposed in his ministry. I would be willing to bet that your resistance of the evil one is not as as perpetual as the evil one's attacking of you. This is true of all of us, but Jesus Christ perfectly resisted the evil one. Three times in the wilderness the devil came to him, and three times the Lord Jesus rebuffed him. And every time Jesus faced the evil one and temptation in his ministry, the Lord was victorious each and every time. You and I have been guilty of giving in to the devil's schemes. This isn't anything wild and radical. It should be easy for us to admit and confess, yeah, I don't have to think real hard about how I was lied to by the evil one and I gave in to his schemes. But Jesus Christ obeyed perfectly, not so that he could gloat over us and say, psh, I'm better than Job. But Jesus obeyed perfectly so that he could be our spotless lamb and our savior. Friend, Have you been tripped up and deceived by the evil one and fallen to his advances? Jesus Christ doesn't know what that's like because he's always beat him. And Jesus Christ extends his hand to you and says, let me be your savior. Secondly, Saint, I hope you see this in these first six verses. That this passage is making clear to us that God's sovereign rule is perpetual and perfect as he sits enthroned over angels and demons. Satan belongs to God and has always been securely leashed. Not only has God always ruled over this adversary, but in Christ, God disarmed this enemy and put him to open shame by triumphing over him at the cross. Part of the cross is not only... So much of the work being done at the cross was for us, was for the church. Yet at the same time, there was an important element of what Christ did at the cross simply to triumph over this enemy. And Christ triumphed over the evil one at the cross. Because of God's unbroken and sovereign rule and his victorious battle at the cross, we can sing with Luther as we did not too long ago. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Why? Because we're strong? No. Lo, his doom is sure, and one little word will fell him. 
Friends, I, I want you to see and to tremble to think about the reality of Satan's attack constantly coming after you. He doesn't take breaks so he can get his calories up. He doesn't get dehydrated. He's coming after you constantly and perpetually. Yet God's sovereign rule is unbroken and perfect, and this enemy is always on a leash. The strivings of Satan continue, and the sovereign rule of God never fails. As God has given Satan permission to attack his body, let's look now at verses 7 and 8 and take note of how Job's pain increases. Let's look at the pain increase in verses 7 and 8. We read there, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery to wit, to which, with which excuse me, to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Satan wastes no time with scheduling his attacks, as it appeared he did in chapter 1. Here, Satan seems to be in a hurry to take advantage of the permission he's given. Verse 7 tells us he struck the entirety of Job's body. No localized pustules will do. Loathsome sores on Job's back isn't enough for Satan. Satan has already touched every area of Job's family, his wealth, and his reputation. Now he deals a painful sickness into the skin of a man who is already lying on the ground in torn clothes and a griever's shaved head. We don't know how much time has passed between these two satanic attacks. It may have been a day, it may have been a, a week or month or perhaps even years between chapter 1 and chapter 2. But we are clearly not led to believe that Job has in any way recovered from the painful losses that he endured in chapter 1. He's still a man grieving the losses that he endured. And now his body, his entire body, has been struck by the evil one. Many of you are in the medical field, and many of you uh, think long and hard about um, diagnoses, and many commentators have spent a lot of, lot of time trying to uh, think about what this precise malady is that Job is enduring. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not conclusive, so we don't know exactly what Job's diagnosis is, but this book gives us a devastatingly clear picture of his symptoms. Um, I spent a little time Googling things like boils, um, to try to understand what Job was going through. And I learned quickly that I was not called to dermatology uh, or the medical field as, as these things just turn my stomach. This is not the way God has, has uh, wired me. Um, but briefly, I won't belabor this more than I think is helpful. Um, listen to what is said throughout the book of Job as it talks about these painful sores that cover his body. So we saw already that it was the crown of his head, the soles of his feet, loathsome sores all over his body. And then in chapter 7, verse 5, Job says, My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then it breaks out afresh. In chapter 30, verse 30, he says, My skin turns black and falls from me and my bones burn with heat. This man becomes emaciated according to chapter 19, verse 20. He's also deeply depressed according to chapter 7, verse 16. Chapter 16, verse 16 says, his face is red with weeping. Chapter 7, verses 4 and 14 say that he endures insomnia and night terrors. And chapter 19, verse 17, tells us that he is a stench to his wife. The evil one has touched Job, and it has not been gentle. Some of you know what some of these things are like. More than one of us has... Uh, 
uh, endured long seasons of depression. Insomnia is not a completely foreign thing to some of us. Night terrors and these um, reoccurring fevers that are going on with Job. Many of you know what this is like. But to the best of my knowledge, we don't have too many instances in our congregation of people's flesh turning black and falling off. We don't have too many instances of flies laying eggs in the sores of our body such that things are crawling out of them and upon them. And Job is not enduring one or two of these things. He's enduring all of it. And this is the result of Satan touching him and attacking him because he worships God. Job's marriage is messed up. So much of this is just so incredibly cruel. Job was already in devastating grief at the end of chapter 1 and his situation, believe it or not, has gotten far worse. He resisted the devil. And the devil made him pay for it. Verse 8 lends itself to seeing the greatness of his sickness as Job gropes for relief by scraping his inflamed skin with broken pottery in the town ash heap where he is exiled and quarantined. Job is like a leper, and it's right and good for him. It seems to be the the conscious thing is to go away from people into a kind of quarantine, and that's what he's doing here in this ash heap. And he's picking up a broken piece of pottery to scrape his sores. This man is in bodily anguish. He's tearing the skin from his body because that relieves some of his pain. Satan's attack is much simpler this time. It seemed complicated in chapter 1. Here, it's less complicated, but it's excruciating nonetheless. Job has already received suffering that could easily grieve him for a lifetime. Ten children buried. But now, his grief is introduced to unrelenting physical discomfort and the psychological torment that that brings. Brothers, sisters, though Job's suffering is of staggering proportion, many of you have tasted this same sort of increasing pain, the same sort of suffering on top of suffering. I don't want you to simply look at Job and say, wow, that's terrible. It is. It really is. But many of you, if not all of us, can relate to having our prayers for relief followed by more trouble. Some of you may be tempted even now to quit praying because your pain has only increased while you've been pleading for help. Please, if that connects with you at all, please let this passage speak to you. The Lord knows your trial. Do you hear me? Even when it seems your prayers are unanswered and a waste of time, the Lord knows your trial. You are not suffering outside of God's vision and care. Though Satan has set out to crush you with a string of attacks, God is ruling over this enemy and has his leash upon him. Your grief is known. And it's not without purpose or meaning, even if that meaning is hidden from you. We've seen how how Satan's cruel attacks have increased Job's grief and his pain. Now I want to take some time to look at his response. How does Job respond when his grief is met with more grief? Let's look at how wise faith persists in verses 9 and 10. As we look for Job's response, the first thing we see is Job's wife's response. We read these words in verse 9. Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. 
It's probably our first reaction to look at this verse and to see this woman as yet another grief in Job's life. Wow. What a help me. Augustine calls her the devil's assistant. Chrysostom calls her the devil's best scourge. And Calvin calls her Satan's tool. These harsh labels are clearly accurate as she encourages her husband to do precisely what Satan is aiming at. Satan set out to get Job to curse God, and she's encouraging him to do that. She is tempting him and encouraging him to give in to the evil one's attack. That is clear. Yet, if we stop and think a bit more about this situation, we might see something a bit more complex. It's common for students of the Bible to see what's lying on the surface Feel like, hey, I understand that. She's a tempter. Moving on. But if we stop and think about this situation, it's not quite that simple. What might a loving wife do in that situation? What would a loving wife do when her husband has lost everything and now he's covered from head to toe with painful sores? This pain and this grief is too complex to simply brush her off as some worthless temptress. Listen, if you simply see her tool of the devil moving on, you're not wrong. But I think if that's all you think of this woman, your your thoughts are too little. Job's wife has also endured all of the grief from the first attack. They were her children who were crushed. Ten of the babies, that all ten of the babies that she carried were killed. She's in grief. All of her comforts and her pleasures, all their worldly possessions were robbed and destroyed as well. She also has lost everything. And now, she's not the one scraping herself, but it's her husband that she's watching suffer intensely under these terrible boils. This woman is enduring great trials and suffering as well and if we just brush her off as a temptress i don't think we see the whole story i don't think we should be too quick to fault her for losing hope i don't think we should be too quick to fault her for thinking that death was the last chance of relief for her husband these certainly aren't the bravest and most praiseworthy thoughts but intense grief has a way of beating you down and drawing the worst out of you And that's what we're seeing here in Job's wife. Yes, she is being used to tempt him to sin, but let's not be too quick to overlook the potential that her loving desire for her husband's relief may be at work in these words. Not only is there a glimmer of compassion in these Satan-sent words, but there's certainly more than the possibility of frustration with the Almighty. She has spent her life with this man who has feared God and turned away from evil more than any other man she's known or ever even heard of. She was present as Job offered sacrifices for her children without fail. More than any other person, she knows what a blameless man her husband has been. And now, after all of this righteous living, After all of her husband's good work, God treats her husband like this. If this is the way God treats his friends, and this is what godly living gets you, then what's the point? Do you see how if we just look at her as a vile temptress and move on, we miss a whole lot of the complexity that's going on in the suffering? She has to deal with the fact that she loves this man who's suffering. And she has lost all hope of him finding relief because grief just keeps getting met with more grief. And she's watched her husband love and obey God. She knows what a righteous man that he is. And it makes at least a little bit of a sense, doesn't it, for her to say, And if God is against us, what's the point? Job's wife is not the central figure of this story, nor is she the great example of faith and worship that we are called to notice. Yet, Job's wife responds to grief and increasing pain in a way that all of us can relate to. 
her hopeless fixation on relief and her expectation that God would do better for his friends strikes a chord of relatability for all of us. When I look at Job, I think, wow, Superman. I don't, that seems unattainable, that kind of godliness. But when I look at Job's wife, I think, yeah, I remember saying some stuff like that. I remember thinking that way. I think it's really important that we not dismiss this woman too quickly. I think it's important that we connect with her because Job's response to her is God's corrective word to your hopelessness and your unbelieving anger. What Job says to her is the same thing that you and I need to hear when we begin to feel and respond like she does. In verse 10, we see Job's response to his grieving and doubting wife. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? Job is a devastated and broken man, yet his faith persists. This man is messed up and deformed from all of the sorrow and the sickness that has come upon him, yet his faith persists persists he doesn't give in to the temptation to hopelessness or rage though he has been all but destroyed job speaks kind yet firm words of reproof to his wife job speaks to her speaking like this you're not speaking like my wise wife you're speaking like some foolish woman this foolishness doesn't suit you sweetheart Yes, this is confusing and hard, but God is free to give us pleasure and pain. It's good and wise for us to trust God's choices even when we don't understand. We may not like His plan, but we can trust His hand. Can you imagine those words coming from a man who's in intensive care, who's being checked on by psychiatrists, and his, his life has been so devastatingly wrecked he says we may not like his plan but we can trust his hand job's wife is easy to relate to but her words are a sinful encouragement to join satan in rebelling against god job's words are absolutely incredible meditate on these words shall we receive good from god and not also evil absolutely incredible they display a wisdom and a faith that is so beautiful that it's hard to understand. Job trusts God when life is easy. And Job trusts God when life is incredibly hard. Job's worship continues when it's desperately inconvenient and painful. Do you hear me? His worship continues even when it's desperately painful and inconvenient. Even when his prayers for comfort are met with more demonic assault, Job's faith is wise and persists in believing in God's goodness. The sovereign Lord of heaven and earth may be acting in ways that seem cruel, but Job refuses to get angry or to give in to despair. By wisdom... Job's faith persists. He hasn't given up. He's still persevering. His wisdom from the Lord is helping him to continue trusting God, even as even what seems like he had nothing left seems to be taken from him. As Job receives his wife's compassionate temptation and firmly rejects it, we see a reflection of the faithfulness of Jesus who heard the Apostle Peter try to turn him away from going to the cross. As Peter sought to save Jesus from suffering, like Job, Jesus rebuked Peter in Mark 8.33. And we read these words of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And as Job humbly bowed his aching, grieving, itching, and pain-filled head before his Maker, he glorifies God and manifests the glory that we see perfectly in Jesus. The Son of God endured scorn his entire ministry, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus trembled as he faced the coming horrors of his betrayal, the intense abuse of his trial, the humiliation and torture of his crucifixion, and the unimaginable torment of God's wrath upon sin. 
Yet under this burden, under this weight, Jesus prayed, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. God the Father didn't remove the cup of suffering, and Jesus wisely trusted and obeyed his Father. Instead of calling down 12 legions of angels to escape his suffering, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, and by his wounds we have been healed. Jesus could have pulled the ripcord at any time. Jesus could have abandoned ship whenever he wanted, but he didn't. He endured and he trusted his Father, as Job gives us a picture of. Jesus bore the wrath of our sinful pursuits of pleasure, and he endured the punishment we deserve for rebelling with Satan instead of trusting God. Friends, listen. If you look at Job, you see this remarkable example of wise faith. But what did it accomplish? His persisting in faith was a glorious thing. It was a good thing, and I don't want to say anything negative about it. But Jesus' persistence secured salvation for sinners like you and me. Jesus' faithfulness, Jesus' perfect life, Jesus' enduring of the wrath of God secured forgiveness for those who repent and believe. Not only did Jesus do this for everyone who will fear God and turn from evil, but he also has given us the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weakness, works in us so that we bear the fruit of love, patience, and faithfulness, and self-control, even in our trials. Christ bore our failings and gives us the Spirit who teaches us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be encouraged to see in Job a picture of what wise faith looks like. This is the the faith that we want to be striving towards and praying for. But in Christ we see wise faith and we see a sacrificial death that takes care of the guilt that you and I have incurred because we have all given in to rebellion. We have all succumbed to Satan's schemes, and we have all failed to trust God when it got hard. In Job, we see an inspiring and instructive example of godliness in grief, and in Jesus, this same godliness does what only the Son of God can do by laying down his life for us and for our salvation. I want you to see both this I want to grow to be more like Job. Yet at the same time, see Christ supporting you and saying, I'm picking up all of your slack. I'm taking care of all of your guilt and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit who will help your faith to grow in wisdom and perseverance. Jesus gave his life for our forgiveness and has given us the Spirit so that we too might die to the sins of anger and hopeless unbelief and live to righteousness by the power of the Spirit at work in us. Brothers and sisters, God has promised to give you his spirit to help you have faith that perseveres in the wisdom of trusting God even when it seems so bleak. We need this reminder. We need this continual being brought back to the gospel, continual being brought back to the reality that Christ gave himself for us. Otherwise, we drift off and we think that it's all up to me. I have to somehow be good enough for God's love. And the reality of it is we just can't. We can't have the faith of Job without God's help. But by the Spirit promised to us in Christ, we have this. 